Have you ever had the uncomfortable experience of going to your boss and asking for a promotion? Maybe if you're a planner like me, you sort of think up your speech ahead of time and make a list of your qualifications. You're going to go to your boss and say, I think I deserve this job because I'm the best. I have the best skills, the best work ethic, I'm the very best on the team, and I promise you won't be disappointed. Now, for most of us, just thinking about giving that little speech is a little nerve-wracking. Bragging about ourselves is the very last thing we want to do. In today's lesson, the disciples are asking for a promotion of sorts. They ask Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Sure, they're not being direct, but they're sort of sidestepping their way into asking, how do we, as the chosen few, get all the honors? How do I become the best? And Jesus, as he so often does, answers unexpectedly. He tells them, you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven unless you become humble like one of these children. Whoever is humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. This is pretty radical talk for the time. Children weren't thought of as being lifted up and valuable, but they were everything that the culture of the time didn't think was valuable. They had little or no education. They were powerless, vulnerable, sometimes considered a burden. It's estimated that half of children didn't make it to the age of 10. And Jesus is telling these grown men who have been traveling with him for months proving their worth that they can't even enter the kingdom of heaven unless they become like these people, like little children. Jesus' answer to the question is a total flip of what the disciples were probably expecting, and it's a call to humility. And this becomes the theme of the rest of his discourse in this lesson. Now, I want to let you in on my sermon writing process a little bit. When I looked at today's text and was praying at themes that the Holy Spirit might be guiding me towards, read the text and wrote in the margin of my notes, humility. I kept reading and there's the theme again, humility. I couldn't get away from it. And I began to get a little bit worried. Not because humility seemed like something that would be difficult to talk about or difficult to understand, but because it almost seemed too easy. I think there's this discourse among people who work hard all their life that we've already got humility covered. So why spend any time on it? When Jesus says, you need to be humble in order to enter the kingdom of God, my gut reaction is, great, I've already got that covered. Make a little check mark in my Bible. But I wonder if we're sort of shortchanging what Jesus is describing here. The idea we have in our head when people talk about pride and humility is that scene from the beginning of going up to a job promotion and bragging about yourself with some larger-than-life personality. And we would probably say that if that's something you enjoy, you might have to deal with some pride issues. But for the rest of us, I think we normally discount it as something to work on. But we should remember that Jesus never wastes his breath. And you know that when a pastor makes a three-point sermon series all on the same theme, that it's probably something to pay attention to. And here Jesus has done just that. He's created three sermons all on this theme of humility. He starts with saying that humility is important in relation to the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to explain how it's important for our relationship with each other and with God too. So let's look at what he's doing here. He starts out with what I'll call the uncomfortable parable of the shepherd with horrible risk management strategies. He's got these 99 perfect, good, healthy sheep, and he leaves them all in a mountain to go on this wild goose chase after one sheep that has already gone astray, has already had some fault. This is the story that makes all of the accountants and probably the farmers in the room shake their head a little bit. Jesus, what are you thinking here? Not to mention, if we assume that God in this story is the shepherd, as he's often called in the Bible, and that all of us are the 99 sheep, how humiliating for us to be left behind on some mountain while the shepherd goes off after this one who's misbehaved? 
That's just not how the world works. This isn't the feel-good story of the prodigal son or the woman who finds her lost coin. Jesus here seems to contradict the world as we know it, and it appears to be at our expense, a blow to our pride and assault on how we think the world should operate. And if that wasn't good enough, his next sermon takes it a step further. Jesus says that humility isn't just the center of our relationship with God, but it's also important for how we relate to the church among fellow Christians. Jesus says that when there's conflict in the church, rather than cutting a person out, that we are to seek reconciliation, not once, not twice, but three times. And even if that doesn't work, to leave the opportunity for forgiveness and absolution, the binding and loosing of sins. This would seem to be at tension with how the disciples probably thought that the temple already operated. In the temple, if you were declared to be sinful or unclean, your options were going to be to be put in jail, death, or thrown out of the community until you could make amends somehow, until you could bring a sacrifice that would satisfy that requirement. There wasn't this searching out for reconciliation. It's just not how it worked. And it's really not how our world works either. The picture is so different from our times. Apologies, they don't really make the cut in our world. Company leaders and people who want to avoid legal trouble, avoid them. And I can't say that I've seen this method employed when Facebook battles come out in fa in, on the internet. It's just not how our cancel culture of the time works. Christian or non-Christian, big issue or little issue, when someone wounds our reputation or attacks our views, it's hard to step back in humility and for our first impulse to be reconciliation. The world has, rather, has rarely been so conflicted, so convinced that we're right and everyone else is wrong, and yet so unwilling to seek any reconciliation. So we get a very clear picture here. Jesus is asking us to consider humility and the extension of mercy towards our neighbors. And he isn't presenting this as some sort of virtue that maybe we'll work on when we've got everything else under control. But he puts it at the very center of life as a Christian. And I think as we start to dig into each of those sermons and compare them to how our world operates, we see maybe we think we have humility under control, but it's not how the world operates it's not really how our hearts operate either. In fact, maybe it's our own insistence on our humility that reveals a sign of how prideful we really are. The reason we're uncomfortable about boasting about ourselves is we don't want to be contradicted. We don't want to lift ourselves up and then not be perceived that way. We're prideful of our supposed humility and probably not in the stereotypical ways of running around bragging, your, bragging about yourself to everyone. I don't see that here. But in the subtle ways that we think about ourselves and act towards each other. Maybe we struggle with it so deeply that nobody else even notices. We may assume that those who politically don't agree with us must be idiotic or motivated by evil, or that anyone who doesn't take our point of view on something isn't worth connection with, or that any scripture that contradicts how we already live must be ill-informed, dated, or wrong. Each of us, somewhere in our life, struggles with that sin of pride at one point or another. In fact, when the early church looked at the whole list of sins in the Bible and tried to examine them all, they said maybe it's pride that is the root of all sin. After all, pride breaks the first commandment, you are to have no other gods. And by making ourselves a god, we just give ourselves permission to break the rest. We may consider pride to be kind of a personal problem, something that only really bothers us but it ends up extending into all of our relationships and even our relationship with God. Pride starts off by isolating us from each other, like racers who are racing against each other instead of walking alongside. You can see that in the disciples' question too. They were going as one unit, centered on Christ, looking at his direction, and then suddenly they're asking, who can be the greatest? You can kind of see those sideways glances maybe between James rolling his eyes at John and Andrew muttering under his breath about Matthew. When people are just sources of approval, 
objects to compare ourselves to, there can be no real relationship. Ironically, when our goal is to impress all those around us, we give up the ability to be truly known and loved. We hide our true selves, afraid that people will see through the cracks of our pride, and we lose the chance to fulfill our deepest need, the need for mercy and forgiveness that comes with unconditional love, the type of love that God so wants to give us. This even ends up affecting some of our closest relationships in our families to those we're very close to, and it ends up isolating us from them. And pride alienates us from God, too, making us think that we can rely on our abilities alone. Just look again at the disciples' question. They weren't concerned about Jesus' teaching for the day. They weren't concerned about God's plan for their life. And this is really sad. They weren't even concerned about Jesus' love for them. Their pride had given them a one-track mind. How can I be the best? After all, I already deserve it. And contrary to the message our world gives about pride being some sort of freeing form of self-love and self-affirmation, pride becomes a burden that we can never live up to. Let's consider how pride normally operates in practice. You may have heard this story on the internet, but I think it's a good one to illustrate the point. There's a woman and she's waiting for an airplane. She sits on a bench and she's got a bag of cookies with her. She notices a man comes and sits right beside her. She notices he takes one of her cookies from the bag. She tries to ignore it, just, you know, mind her own business. But then she notices every single time that she takes a cookie, he's taking one too. She's getting pretty annoyed now. I mean, talk about crossing boundaries and being impolite, right? Finally, they're down to one cookie. She just wonders, what is he going to do now? He breaks it in half and gives half to her. She is in a fit of rage now. I mean, he just doesn't get it. These are hers. He can't just take them. She is so mad. She gets into the line and gets on the airplane, just tries to forget it, tries to relax. She's going to read her book. And so she opens up her purse, and in her bag, she sees the unopened bag of cookies. She had mixed them up. He hadn't been taking her cookies. She had been taking his now, probably some of us haven't gotten in fights over baked goods recently, but we all can relate to this story at one point or another. We have all been in the situation where we're so convinced that we're right and then realize we really aren't. The woman in the story wasn't being a stereotypical prideful person. She wasn't tugging on Jesus' sleeve, asking how she could be the best. And yet, that sliver of pride that she deserved the cookies more than him, that there couldn't be a good reason why he was taking them, that she must be right because she's always right. It destroyed any chance of solving that conflict, any chance of reconciliation or finding something new. Now, can you imagine how that whole story might have changed if humility and mercy had been the motivating factors? Humility isn't putting up false accusations onto ourselves, but it's realizing truly and honestly who we are and what we've done. For humans, it's realizing we're not perfect, that each of us is guilty of sin. And sometimes it takes a serious blow to our pride for us to realize just how much we're clinging to it. And you know that sermon that Jesus told of the 99 sheep and the one? It's only uncomfortable if we're too proud to admit that sometimes we are the lost sheep. Jesus wasn't trying to be mean or unfair or cruel. He's just speaking the truth, that we all need humility. As Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The bad news is that we all need to work on humility because we have all fallen short and sinned. But the good news is that Jesus' response when we confess our sins, it's not what we expect. It isn't vengeance or hatred or punishment, but instead it's mercy. Because in Jesus, we have the best example of humility of all. He willingly humbles himself to a state of utter humiliation, death on a cross, so that rather than the judgment we deserve, we receive this free gift of grace.
just as mercy would have changed that whole interaction between the woman and the man with the cookies. The introduction of mercy changes how we can receive Jesus' call to humility too. This isn't about dragging our feet and wallowing in how sinful we are, but mercy changes humility into good news, something we can even celebrate. You see, mercy breaks open the pattern of power and pride because it opens up a new way of life opposed to pride. Mercy is humility lived out that allows for a true knowing of ourselves and one another, where we no longer need to hide between the false facade of our pride because we know that our worth comes not from our own merit, but in God's mercy towards us and his claim to us as children of God. Knowing that God is merciful allows us to openly confess our sins to God, to come to him like that humble child, humble and unafraid. And this is exactly why Jesus puts humility at the very center of life as a church. This is why there isn't a trophy or a plaque or a throne at the front of our sanctuary. But at the center, we place a cross. Because at the very center, of the sanctuary is a cross because it's the place of complete humility, of complete mercy, and paradoxically, the only place that we can truly boast because the cross has nothing to do with our own actions and everything to do with God's actions for us. God's intent for his church is to be a body of people that operates very differently from the world and how the world expects us to act. The church isn't a community competing against each other on who can be the best, but the purpose of the church is to be centered on confession, servanthood, discipleship, and relationship. These things that force us to look beyond ourselves in order to turn to Christ. And in light of the cross, humility can become truly good news. Because in the emptying of ourselves, we can receive Christ as he enters in. He joyfully searches us out, and he gathers us in his arms. And in that place of true humility, of true relationship with God, it can be a comfortable place of freedom where we stop relying on our pride and on our own qualifications. Just imagine, again, going to that job promotion interview, and rather than being so concerned with whether you're really good or really bad or whether you have what it takes, knowing that it's ultimately not up to you, but up to God. To trust that God will give you the strength you need, and if it's not his will, to have the humility to know that his plan is bigger than our own. Imagine if humility and mercy were at the center of all the decisions in our life, not only in the little pains and wrongs of the day in the stealing cookies or job promotions, but how liberating when we've been truly wronged when how we relate to each other no longer needs to be bound up in the lists of qualifications or pride, but in the lifting each other up, based first on Christ's love for each of us as children of God. That's life-changing, and that's world-changing. Just like Jesus pulling that small child into his arms changed the whole conversation of what the disciples were expecting, mercy always changes the conversation. The world is always going to expect us to seek out how to be the greatest. But if our eye is on the kingdom, we see what it costs. We can never live up to the burden of our pride's expect expectations. But to say that I will trust in Christ's qualifications for myself and for my neighbor, to say that I'm going to be one of humility and mercy who will seek reconciliation when possible, and leave forgiveness open when it's not possible. That changes the paradigm of how we relate to each other here in our families, in our schools, in our communities, putting relationships before our pride. It doesn't need to compromise right or wrong, but it makes the conversation not about power or status at all, but about Christ's love and forgiveness. And it is right in the context of those relationships where people are gathered, not in our own name, but in the name of Christ, where we have no need to boast in ourselves, where Christ has promised to be present. And in the presence of Christ, we can boast in something far greater than ourselves, 
We can boast in the victory of the cross, in having been lost, in having been found, and in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray together. Holy God, you gather us together in a church as a good shepherd, as a holy father. You give us mercy even when you don't de- we don't deserve it. And we thank you for your love and your abundant mercy. Help us to remember where our value comes from and search out our hearts for our places where we have false pride. God, we ask in the real conflicts in this world that you would show us how to be people of mercy that point not to our own glory, but in the victory and the hope of the church and of the cross. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.